Blog Talk Radio. Hello everyone, good morning. This is Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 8 o'clock here in the morning on Friday, April the 22nd, and um, this is one shot of be survivor to another. I'm glad to be here. And we're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And chat room is open if anybody would like to sit in there. I did pop the link in there uh, to what I was talking about all week and looking at a, an article, a web page actually, a, a series of web pages written about the inner child and uh, codependency and whatnot. It's from Robert Bernie. And uh, yeah, so hopefully some people, someone will get something out of this. I know that I have. Um, it's good information for me looking at uh, the inner child work and um, looking at adult survivors of child abuse. You know, looking at uh, codependency and, and different things like like that. So it's it's good information, and I think it's quite interesting what he's presented there. It's a little different than some of the stuff that I've seen out there, and so I'm sort of you know it's it's good to take a look at it. And whether we, you know, it, we agree with it or not, it's, it's. I like to keep an open mind um, as far as my healing journey goes because you never know. I might run into something that really makes sense to me and actually helps me see something in a different light, so that I can, um, you know, learn to um, sort of move around or, or move past something that I'm sort of stuck in. And I think for my inner child, that's something that I'm still working on. Um, yeah, all the time. So um, this information is quite interesting. So yeah, thanks for being here, everybody. I appreciate it. I'm usually on at six o'clock in the morning, and this morning I had an opportunity to sleep in, so I just moved the show a couple hours ahead, and because I have time today to actually do that, which I rarely do. So it's great. Um, I hope everybody is okay and and uh, has a good weekend. I know it's Easter weekend, and um, so many people don't have families. So many people don't have anybody to celebrate, um, you know, any holidays with, right? So, you know, I would say to celebrate it on your own if you are on your own. That's what I did for many years. And, uh, you know, it's uh, people would be having Christmases together, and I knew families would be getting together all around, you know, the world celebrating Christmas. You know, many people, even if they're not Christian, celebrate Christmas. And, um, you know, some years I was actually on my own, and, and I still celebrated myself. I used to go and get myself uh, those... Um, those bags at the store where you, you know, there's like surprise bags of, of goodies that you don't know what's in it. And I would buy myself a present and I wouldn't know what it was because it was in one of those surprise gift bags. And um, and that would be my Christmas present to myself. So I've actually done stuff like that just to be, um, just to try to do something good for myself on holidays when there was nobody around and um, and still actually enjoy the, the time and the day even on my own. So I've done lots of stuff like that. So I would just say, you know, wherever you're at in, in the moment, you know, try to find some peace and enjoy it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I want to continue talking about this article and what, I, what I'm reading here from this Robert Bernie. He's got a whole series of web pages, and this is found on about.com. And if you go to the actual site map of what his what his work is, he has a whole lot of information posted here on about.com. It's Robert Bernie. And what we were looking at all week was an article that he wrote called Loving the Wounded Child Within. And um, he's written a book, and I don't know, maybe more than one, but he's particularly talking about this one book called Codependence, The Dance of Wounded Souls by Robert Bernie. And I've never, <clears throat> excuse me, I've never read the book. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I've heard of him. And um, so I don't have the book. I've never read it. But I'm just going through what he has on his website and sort of taking a look at what he's saying about the inner child and, you know, he says, we need to rescue and nurture and love our inner children and stop them from controlling our lives. And uh, he says, stop them from driving the bus. He says, children are not supposed to drive. They're not supposed to be in control. And so by allowing our, what he's saying I, throughout the, the web page is that our inner child or inner children that are wounded within us, um, we're actually allowing them to control what we do in life because they're making the decisions for us these inner children from so long ago growing up in an abuse, abusive environment, being abused or just growing up in a dysfunctional home or, you know, whatnot, um, codependent type behaviors and whatnot, we're actually letting these children rule our lives basically by making decisions based on how we felt as a nine-year-old or how we felt as a four-year-old <laughs> or even an infant, you know, and I think that, that that's very true. And I know in my case, just looking back, uh, a lot of the decisions I've made in my lifetime, many, many of them as an adult, um, have been based on how I felt as a child. And they were all uh, protect, self-protection measures. So basically I've been kind of allowing my inner child to rule my life in many areas, all because of the abuse that I suffered. So I think this is quite interesting to take a look at and 
Um, he talks a lot about the, you know, the ownership of and taking ownership and taking responsibility for ourselves, and you know, not that we have to, you know, we have to. Basically, what he says is that we should not be taking on the blame for what happened to us as children. And obviously, it's not our fault, and we can't, we can't, we can't take on responsibility. But he says, as adults, we were supposed to, we're supposed to take ownership and responsibility of all of our parts of ourselves, and so in doing that. You know, we can we we can kind of become a whole self, and I think that's what he's talking about. And when you when you read this, it's really quite interesting. So this is what we've been talking about all week, and he kind of goes on to explain the whole thing about codependency, and uh, he, he we left off talking about that. And he says the only way we can be whole is to own all of the parts of ourselves. By owning all the parts, we can have we then have choices about how we respond to life. And by denying, hiding, and suppressing parts of ourselves, we doom ourselves to live life in reaction. So he says, a technique, this is him talking here, Robert Bernie. He says, a technique I have found very valuable in this healing process is to relate to the different wounded parts of ourselves as as different state, ages of the inner child. So different ages of the inner child. And he says, these different ages of the child may be literally tied to an event that happened at that age. Uh, for example, he says, when I was seven, I tried to commit suicide. Or the age of the child might be a symbolic designator for a pattern of abuse, deprivation, that occurred throughout our childhood. For example, the nine-year-old within me feels completely emotionally isolated and desperately needs uh, needy, lonely, a condition which was true for most of my childhood, he said, and not tied to any specific incident so, um, you know, that happened to him when he was nine. That's what he was saying. So we have to get in touch with and and, and allow ourselves to get back in touch with these children from these different stages of our lives where we were wounded. And I know that I, when I think about my inner child, because I've done some inner child work, not a whole lot, but some. And I sit back and I, I totally know who, what my inner child looks like and what age she is. It's right around seven years old, six, six, seven years old. And that's where she's sitting. That's where, you know, I picture myself as probably more closer to seven years old um, even with the clothes that I was wearing at the time, um, an outfit that I had that I particularly liked to wear. I didn't have very many clothes. <laughs> we were we were kind of poor. I talk a lot about that. And um, I actually had a, a shirt that I really loved to wear and this pair of red pants. I had the worst, uh, I had the worst choice in clothing, and I still do. Um, I'm just a fashion nightmare, actually, and it's horrible, but I can't help it. And so I think it's what it is. Is I've just I grew up just wearing hand-me-downs or whatever my parents could could get for me. So I was not dressed prop really nicely most of my life as I was growing up as a child. And so I had a, a little bit different taste in, in clothing, and I would find certain pieces of clothing that I thought were really cool. And, I, and whether they went together or not, the pants and the top, it didn't really matter. But that was back in the 1970s, and nobody really cared <laughs> back in the 1970s. You could wear whatever you wanted. Um, it wasn't such an issue, right? <clears throat> So I have an outfit that I kind of picture my inner child wearing, and she's still there. She's still sitting there, uh, of course, on her own there. But she used to be really upset. This this person within me that was young and, and still a child, and and uh, crying and miserable and angry and rage. You know, I, I could feel the rage from her and the anger and the sadness, really the grief and despair. I used to be able to really relate to how my inner child was feeling. And I mean, even today, I look in there, I take a little look inside myself, and I say, okay, my inner child is definitely in a better place now um, than she ever was, because I don't have the same rage or the same anger, um, you know, or the same feelings of, of so much unworthiness or unlo un being feeling so unloved, you know. And um, so she is getting better. She's getting, she, you know, my inner child is learning that, you know, to, to heal, right, because I'm healing. So, I mean, this is obviously, you know, as as I work through my, my healing progression, you know, that's it's getting better. Oh, yeah, and I always say this on every show, you know, I'm not a counselor or therapist. If you go back and listen to all of my shows, I've done about 680 shows. Um, I, I say this on every show. I'm not a counselor or therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows. And um, so you have to listen at your own discretion. I'm just talking about my story here. Um, this is my healing journey, actually. I don't really um, plan this show. Yeah, I'm actually on my healing journey. So while I'm doing these shows, you're, I'm experiencing exactly what I'm experiencing at the time, and uh, allowing myself to work through it through, through this medium. And really, what it does is it allows me to handle my healing journey in small chunks instead of thinking about this all day. So because I have to work and I, I have a life, you know, um, and I and I choose self-help. So what this does is it allows me to handle this stuff in manageable chunks, um, so that 
you know, I can look at it, I can take it out, look at it for a while in a in a safe a safe way without getting too emotional or too, uh, you know, too dragged down into the mud of, you know, possible depression or, or anything like that or too much anger, or too much rage, right? So it allows me to look at it for, you know, for at least a half an hour per day or even a little bit longer to think about what I'm going to, what I'd like to talk about with, with everybody here. Um, so it's about 45 minutes probably. So that's why show, you know, you have to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows, and I say that on every show, and it's on my show page, uh, because it's, uh, you know, it's sensitive material, and a lot of people, you have, if you're just starting your healing journey, you might find that it's it's upsetting because it's triggering, and people who are just starting their healing journeys have to be very careful what they're listening to, and anybody else who's sensitive to the topics of abuse might find it upsetting, so you have to listen at your own discretion, and young children under the age of, anybody under the age of 18, I ask that you have permission to listen to my shows. Um, just because there's adult, I believe in protecting children at all times. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, and um, we, we're standing up to, to fight to save children's lives. And so, anybody under the age of 18, I just ask that you have someone listen to the show with you, and make sure that it's something that is age appropriate for you, an older teen, or you know, if you're a young child, you need to have your parents or somebody um, make it help you make a decision whether you should be listening, right? So I'll get right into this. But thanks, everybody. I just want to make sure I mention that. Because I do it on every show in the morning. When I first get on, I usually say that right away so people know. Um, yeah, that's the thing. I I, I look you know, at my, at my inner child, and I know I've done a lot of healing over the last four years because I don't feel the same rage and the same, um, just the same suffering going on from my inner child inside. So I know that I'm making progress, you know. But I still think I, I have some things to work through because there's still, I'm still sitting under this cloud of, um, Feeling, you know, incomplete. Something's missing still, you know, for my inner child. Something's still missing, and I think it, it possibly could be acceptance, right? It could be um, the whole idea of just being unwanted and unloved my my entire childhood, and just feeling that I was worthless and useless and wanting to be accepted. So basically, I'm the only one that can do that for my inner child. I have to accept myself, right? So I think that why yesterday I was talking about what what Robert Bernie said here when he said you have to own all the parts of ourselves, right? <clears throat> and we have to accept what happened to us, right? And I've heard this on other websites. I've seen this from other books and information that I've that I've been you know looking at for especially over the last year and a half, two years, and um, it, it's it makes sense to me. But part of me doesn't want to do that because part of me wants to say no. I don't want to own that that abuse. I don't want to own that stuff. And that's what I was talking about yesterday, if anybody wants to go back and listen to that show. But um, I understand why he's saying it, because we do have to learn how, at some point, to completely accept ourselves as, as we are. And I mean, it, you know, and I'm not sure if I've done that. You know, I say I've done it, like, you know, that, that, I, that I accept myself and I love that, that person that I was and, you know, trying to nurture myself and trying to... Um, self-soothe and trying to learn how to love myself, which I've done, right? Um, it took me four years. <laughs> it took me a better part of two years, actually, because I've been doing really quite well for the last two years. But it has taken me a while to just even to learn how to self-soothe and how to say, okay, I do love myself. I am worth it. You know, I didn't deserve that abuse that I went through. and You know, I didn't deserve, nobody does, right? And so... Um, it's taken me uh, four years to get where I'm at today, right? Because I started my healing journey four years ago, actually this month. So pretty much to the month, right, to the day. Um, so that's the thing. It's, uh, you know, it's it's a hard road. But I think if we look in, if we really do take the time to, um, you know, to get in touch with ourselves, you know, which a lot of people don't do because we don't take the time for it. And we don't even maybe realize that we, that we should or, or that it might help us to do that. But I think whatever you do, you have to make sure you're in a safe enough place to do it. Because I know, like, I've, I'm okay to look at my past. I'm okay to to um, take a look at what happened to me as a child and even to go back and allow myself to feel some of those things. And um, I'm fine to do that because I know that I'm not going to hurt myself. And I proved that to myself four years ago when I made the, the clear decision, a conscious decision and a commitment to myself. You know that I was going to not self injure. That I was going to stay here. That I wasn't going to commit suicide. That I was never going to plan my suicides again. And that was four years ago when I made that commitment to myself and allowed myself to heal. I, I just allowed myself to get help. Is what I did. I didn't say, "Oh, I'm going to allow myself to heal." I just said, "Okay, I'm going to reach out and get help. I'm going to, I'm going to, put, you know, find that help." And I just allowed myself to reach out to people, and that's where my healing journey started. 
And so, you know, I know that I'm safe enough to do this kind of stuff, to work on this stuff by myself, but not not everybody is. And so you have to be very careful what you're doing as a survivor if you're a survivor of child abuse, you know, or, or any type of abuse. You know, you, you need to have support and you don't feel com- like you can, can really cope with um, looking at your inner child or looking at the memories. You very well might need somebody to do that with you. And so whether, I mean, it be, whether whatever makes sense to you, whether it's a counselor or a therapist, whether it's a, a group support thing, you know, uh, whether it's remaining anonymous and going online to these online group support people, you know, I, that's what I did because I didn't trust uh, counselors and therapists. I still have a bit of a problem with that, and um, because I I know that people can hurt people, and just because somebody says they're a counselor or a therapist doesn't mean that they can't hurt you or make it worse. But I want to say that it's not a good idea to see a counselor or therapist because I've actually ran into a couple of counselors or therapists uh, and therapists that I thought were pretty cool, you know, and that they did care and that they are just normal people trying to help. So it's kind of what we need. We have to find out what are what we want, you know, and we have to think about that. Do I want private, um, you know, consultation with a counselor or do I want more of a group, sort of set, you know, where I can get help from various people and be more open about it? Everybody's different. And everybody needs different things. For me, I, I like that group support thing. And I like just having safety in numbers, right? And um, the whole idea of being isolated with one counselor just uh, actually terrifies me. Um, because then they have control. They have the power. And I like to keep control of my power, right? So I don't need it. I, don't, I think that would be the worst thing I could do, actually, would go to see a counselor or a therapist. But, the, but I know that other people might need to. And I know I actually know lots of survivors, which I will not name names. Who go to counselors and therapists, and they've some have said that you know they've experienced some really good 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 help, you know, and others have said not that their counselors and therapists did not work for them. So that's why we're all different. We all might need different things, right? But whatever it is, make sure you get some help. Um, even just calling a crisis line if you can't cope, just make sure that you do get some help. We certainly didn't deserve uh, what was put on us, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Getting back into this, talking about the inner child here. That's the thing. I know I still have some work to do, even though, you know, um, I know I've done some work, right? So I feel much better now, but I still feel like I'm kind of, you know, there's something there. I know, I don't know if it's a resistance. I've heard that, you know, survivors of abuse can put up walls and resist some of the healing, some of the, some of the things that we need to do in order to heal. So some of the steps, we might resist some of the steps that we, it takes to do the work, right, in order to feel better. But I think it's just... It takes time. We can't just rush this stuff, right? And that's why um, I think it t- you have to see things in a certain light before they make sense. And for me, this ownership thing, you know, I mean, even yesterday I was saying it really really doesn't make any sense to me to own something that I don't don't feel that ever should have happened to me in the first place, which was the abuse that I suffered. Um, you know, I don't feel like... Because I've always sort of equated it to having a necklace around my neck that was... Uh, full of all this garbage and, and pain and misery and suffering from my parents and from my sibling. And that's the abuse that I suffered, right, my whole childhood. And it was just hanging around my neck on, on this huge necklace that was weighing me down, you know, bringing me down. And I was carrying all this horror around with me. And I I sort of thought about it. And I thought, I just, I'll just take this necklace off and I'll just throw it away. I don't even have to have that necklace. That's not mine, you know. I didn't put that stuff on me. My parents put that stuff on me and my sibling, mainly the those are the culprits. And they they're the ones who did that to me and they've made me wear this necklace full of pain and agony and and uh and sorrow and grief and, and hell hell and misery and everything else and put that around my neck and expected me to wear that the rest of my life, you know. I'm like, "No, I don't have to wear that thing." So I, I imagine myself taking this imaginary necklace off my neck and throwing it away, never to return, you know. And so, yeah, I haven't picked that necklace back up, I tell you that, because it's gone. It's gone. It's, there's no way I could pick it back up because I threw it away forever, right? So in my own imaginary, you know, thinking process, right? And so I felt a lot better when I did that because I realized, hey, I didn't deserve any of that. And I certainly didn't do anything to warrant the abuse that I suffered as a child all the way through, even up having to put up with my dysfunctional, insane, crazy parents all the way until my mother died at the age of, you know, of whatever. She was 68 years old. I was just turning 30. And then my dad, who's still living, who's 90, he's almost 90, he's been getting very close to 90, and he's still just as insane as he ever was, and just, you know, dysfunctional, codependent, and everything else, and uh, toxic. So, I mean, I can't have anything to do with him because he's too toxic. And so, you know, um, I thought, why do I have to wear this thing all my life, you know? So 
like within the last four years, I've taken it off and thrown it away. And I feel so much better. The weight is lifted, you know, and I don't have to carry that stuff around with me anymore. And what I have to do now is just reach my child and, and kind of go back and allow myself to work through the process of, of getting my, my inner self to feel okay, that it's okay, that life is good, and that, you know, that we... We do have to be careful. We can't, you just can't trust everybody. As a matter of fact, you can't trust anybody because people do hurt people. <laughs> Even the nicest people that you think would never hurt anybody do. Everybody hurts everybody, but we got to be very careful who we, who we have in our lives. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I choose supportive people in my life. And the minute somebody is not supportive and becomes abusive and I find that they're toxic, they're out of my life. That's plain and simple. You know, I mean, I've only got so many years left here on the planet. I've spent, you know, I've spent the whole life in hell, and I refuse to go back there. And so I'm very, very picky and particular about who I let into my life uh, as far as people, you know, in my daily walk. Um, I have some awesome friends. I really do. I've always had some awesome friends. But I, I just definitely will not allow anybody in my life who causes me grief because I've had enough grief. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of people thinking they can put their garbage on me and, and get away with it, you know, without an apology and without owning up to what they've done, right? That I refuse, you know. I'm not perfect either. I make mistakes too, but I'm always willing to own up to anything that I've done, you know, because that's what I was always trying to get my parents to do, was take responsibility. So, I mean, as adults, you know, we really have to take responsibility for our behavior. We have to take responsibility for our lives, and we really have to take responsibility for our healing journey. Um, you know, if we're if we're survivors of child abuse, there's nobody that can do that for us. No, and I used to think somebody would be able to take away my pain. I was like, some, someday somebody's going to come into my life and they're going to, they're going to be able to take away this pain. I was just wanting that so bad. I would sit around and I'd be so down, and I'd, I'd be like, why cannot somebody just come into my life and take my pain away? Why not? I mean, there's got to be somebody. And what it was is I was just not realizing that I had to do it myself, and I was sort of thinking that there would be somebody that could do that, right? And I you know, once I started my healing journey and started to study this stuff out, um, I found out that that's impossible. Because nobody's going to be able to get in touch with our inner selves. Nobody's going to be able to really do that. We have to do that. And we have to be able to accept ourselves. If we don't accept ourselves, we certainly can expect that uh, we're going to do much healing. You know what I mean? Because we have to be able to, if you know, in other words, if you don't really love yourself and you don't learn to love yourself, right, then it's almost impossible to allow yourself to feel good about anything that you're doing or anything that, that you're involved with or, or anyone in your life. Because if you don't feel good about yourself and you don't feel feel love towards yourself, then how can you love anything else? You really can't. I mean, as people say they do, but it's not true. My mom was like that. She she used to feel like she hated herself. She'd be like, oh, you know, I hated my I hate myself, I hate my life, and I you know, she was suicidal and she was always talking about killing herself. And then she'd be like, you know, I never deserved any of this, taking on the whole victim, you know, victim mentality, which is where I got all that from, right? And plus being abused by her. So not only did I have to put up with her and her problems, you know, she was abusing me, so I never had any real healthy relationship with my mother, not at all healthy. And, um, you know, she'd be sitting around saying, you know, I, I know, you know, I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve to be treated like that as a child or as, or here now with this relationship with my husband. She would be telling me with because of my dad and the abuse he was inflicting on her. And, you know, she never ever did learn how to love herself. And she didn't love her life. She didn't love her family. She didn't love anything. And she was abused. So she was just exactly the same way as a survivor would be. Who is, I mean, that's why I can take a look at this stuff and I can say, wow, like look at, like my mother is a prime example of somebody who never ever allows themselves to heal, right? Because, I mean, she was abused as a child and then married this man, my dad, <clears throat> you know, at the age of 20 and then had this horrific marriage with this man, you know, like a 48-year marriage with a man who abused her in every way um, and mostly, I would say, psychological but he was also physically abusive to her. He was sexually abusive to her. He was he was a horrible man. He did not love her, and he never, ever told her he loved her. And he never would tell her he loved her. Um, he was a horrible man um, who used to call her names and, you know, when she was young, slap her around. When she got when she was older, he would still try to do that, but my mom was by that time protecting herself, and she would, like, fight back. 
But the thing is, is he was he was a bad man, and he treated her horribly. And so here she was abused as a child. She was a perfect example. Like, she's my example. That's why I chose to go a different way. I'm like, man, I cannot allow myself to go the way that parents went. <laughs> because I don't want to live this life forever. You know, I was already put through this garbage as a child. But I certainly don't want to continue this crap on myself and then have to look back at the end, on the at the end of the road when, at the at my life and say wow what was i doing you know just allowing myself to continue on in this cycle and this dysfunctional abusive garbage that my parents put on me so i thought man you know i'll just use them as an example for my life and do the exact opposite you know so um yeah but that was my mom all over a classic abuse victim she was just a classic abuse victim she just she was abused as a child went into this abusive marriage never got any help used to cry and want help, but wouldn't reach out for help. Um, She actually had the opportunity to get help many, many times. Did not want any of her children, hated her children, because we were all born from rape, you know, except for, I think, the first two or three. And, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. It's, you know, for her to do that. And then at the end of the road, crying the blues, still the victim. She would never, ever get help. And she used to sit around saying, oh, I I don't love myself, I hate myself, and I hate this life. And and that's, you know, if we're going to do that, we have to take responsibility for that at the end of the road. If we're not going to get help and we're not going to allow ourselves to heal and move forward and get help with these dysfunctional behaviors that we really sadly enough picked up from other people that were raising us or whatever, um, or if, you know, if we're having mental instabilities and we're just not coping well and we're hurting people around us or hurting ourselves, we are ultimately responsible for that. And we can't blame an abusive childhood for it. We can't blame, you know, oh, it's a crazy world for it, right? It's just, it's our responsibility. And so that's why I always wish that my mom and dad would have taken responsibility and and and, and owned up to what they did, you know? And they never would. And they, they never will. They never can, right? And so, and then it can never make it right. <clears throat> so I have to make it right, right? And I realized that. I thought, man, I started to realize four years ago, there's nobody that can do this for me. I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to learn to love myself and to um, get in touch with what happened to me as a child and allow myself to heal from this stuff and not carry this anger, this rage, and this hatred, right, which was which was it really eating me inside. It was just eating my heart like it was destroying me. It was tearing me apart, you know, and I, I knew that I was either going to kill myself or I was just going to die from heartbreak, one or the other, but I was not doing well at all four years ago. And, um, you know, I thought, what am I doing, man? I'm doing the same thing my mom's doing. You know, if I hurt myself and injure myself, all all I've done is allow my parents to win this fight, you know, and allow myself to uh, uh, be succumb to to the abuse that I suffered. I thought, that is ridiculous. I'm like an adult. I'm on my own. There's no abusing me now. Like, what's the matter with me that I can't, you know, see this? So I started to really take a good hard look. And it was, uh, you know, it's hard to do sometimes, right? But... You know, we, I have to look at my own behaviors. I have to look at what I'm doing, you know, and make sure that I'm doing things, <clears throat> you know, based on um, healthy decisions, you know, for myself and for in my life, you know. And uh, and so it's been a, a, a long journey, but it's worth it. It's so worth it because I think from where I am today from four years ago is, is like night and day. It's completely, it's completely changed. It's completely different because I'm willing to take a look and get some help. I mean, I do have a lot of support, I'll tell you that. I have a lot of friends who I find a lot of comfort in, and I find that... Um, hello, Bill. Oh, you're here today, Bill. Sorry about that. You're here again. <laughs> I didn't check my chat room. I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. Uh, that's awesome. But yeah, you're right. It's it's um, you, have to have, you have to have people in your life who can help you, you know. And Bill Murray, you've got to check out Bill Murray's show. Bill Murray's show is um, Stop Child Abuse Now, and you can find that here on Blog Talk Radio. BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash Bill, B-I-L-L, hyphen Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y. Stop Child Abuse Now, and he also heads up the National Association for Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, N-A-A-S-A dot work dot com dot org. Um, the National Association for Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. And But be sure and check out Bill Murray's show here. That is awesome, and I try to be in the chat room at least two or three times a week when I can be. I, I think I should be there tonight, I hope. And um, it's a great show, and it will. He, he's talking to survivors. He's talking about preventing and stopping child abuse. It's a group for <clears throat> for survivors who who can 
get help from other survivors, peer to peer, you know. And Bill Murray is a survivor, as well as Jessica, who's on there, and other guests and people that they have on the show. And so it's oh, www.naasca.org. That's the name of the website where you can get some help. National Association for Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. And that's an awesome website. I hope everybody will go and check it out because I want to sp- um, definitely spend some more time on that website. I haven't had much time like this last week or two. But um, thank you so much, Bill, for being here. I appreciate it. And I love what you're doing. And um, I hope to be there tonight in the chat room. But, yeah, we do. We have to get help in whatever way it is. And if you find you're struggling and you just can't cope, you know, you have to call You have to call a crisis line then, even if you want to be anonymous. But you can be anonymous at, at Bill Murray's show too. And you can go and get some help. And you don't have to, um, you know, put your real name. You don't have to tell anybody who you are. You know what I mean? Um, to get help, right? You can remain anonymous in quite a lot of different things. Group support. Um, uh, lots of times people will go to online group support and get anonymous help. You know, you don't have to tell people who you are and disclose your address and all of this stuff. You know what I mean? You can be very much anonymous and get help, right? So make sure you do some help and, you know, just keep reaching out. And, you know, if you reach out, You'll be surprised how many hands will come back to you to reach out to you, and that's what I've found this last four years. That's why I'm doing this show in particular, because I want to let people know that until you start reaching out, people may not realize you're wounded. People may not realize that you need help, because you might be pulling off a really good job at making people think that everything's okay. That's what I've been doing my whole life. You know, oh, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> I've been doing that my whole entire life, because I had to in order to survive. And so, you know, basically not reaching out and getting help because, I, oh, no, everything's fine. When it wasn't fine, I was suicidal, I was depressed, I was down, I was angry, I, had, I wanted to rage, I wanted to kill somebody or myself. It was absolutely horrible. And uh, there was a the rage within me, you know what I mean? And on the outside, I was fine. Oh, yeah. No, everything was great, you know? And in the meantime, the, my internal struggle and turmoil was killing me, literally killing me in every way. So that's why I'm, people many times may not realize that you are suffering and that you need a hand. So sometimes, you know, you have to reach out and you have to say, look, I, I need a hand. I need some support. I need some help. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely. There is something wrong with people who will not reach out or at least even try to do some self-help, right? Because it means that they're not willing to try to even do anything about the situation. <clears throat> right, and we ultimately are responsible as adults for our adult lives, right, so it's so important that you do re- do realize that as children, there was absolutely nothing we could do. I mean, you know you suffer what you suffer as a child because people are making the wrong choices on your behalf, and that's what happened to me my whole entire childhood and um that I couldn't help and and you know there was nothing I could do about that. I made choices based on those choices that they made for me that were my responsibility, but I actually kind of don't take responsibility for some of them. Because they were what they were my reaction to the abuse I was suffering, right? So you know, so many times you know, with children, like actually all the time, it's not our fault. Like we couldn't have done anything different to stop the abuse, to stop that treatment, or whatever it was, right? Um, but as adults, it is our responsibility. It was, it, it always is our responsibility. It was my parents' responsibility as adults to get help for their problems and not abuse their children. But they took the wrong road. They made the wrong choice. And I was really, really gifted, I think, to be able to see this because that's what got me, uh, that's what kept me alive probably, was, you know, something in the back of my mind telling me this is not right. Like what, you know, and, and always not agreeing with what they were doing and saying, man, this is not cool. And my brother's killing themselves, you know. I mean, this sort of thing. It just always bothered me. And I thought, this is this is not cool. And I, I knew that I, I had to do something, you know, and, and uh so that's why four years ago I began my healing journey. So be sure you do stick around and you get some help, whatever way that is. You know, you find something that works for you, and then you go with it. You know what I mean? Have a great day, everybody. I'll be back on tonight. Uh, talking. To, uh, I'll be doing a reading from A Life of Death to Redemption. If anybody's interested in tuning into that tonight, you can check the show page. And then tomorrow I'll be back on with the worldwide epidemic of child abuse and human rights abuses, as well as Sunday, my Mount Bethel Christian Bible study show, which I just like to do. And um, it's actually my, one of my favorites things to do, which is read uh, the Bible. That's one of my favorite things to do, if not the most favorite thing to do. So hopefully um, you can tune in for those as well. And then next week I'll be back on regular regular time. So have a great day, everybody. You know, Make sure you reach out and get some help and don't allow yourself to suffer on in this, right? Just make sure you do stay with us and, uh, and, and, and be well, you know? You certainly deserve to have a good life. So we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> 